this time to you. We want to open these two Bibles. We want to dig into your word. We want to understand it. And we need your help to do that. We need your Holy Spirit to explain it to us. And Lord, grow us today. Help us to be fruitful people in Jesus' name. Amen. I got to do a wedding. And it was in Knoxville. And this, it was one of our youth that had graduated, gone on to college and had graduated. And she was getting married. And I was really excited because I'd known her since she was about eight years old. And she picked this guy that was just fantastic. But her family was a little bit loony. And very much like my own family. And they had their, their issues. And so uh, I was excited and went to the rehearsal. And I'm watching what's going on. And I was like, this is going to be beautiful, but boy, there's a lot of opportunities to screw this up. We're really going to have to get this right. So I get there, I'm in my, my nice robe to do the wedding, and, and uh, the people are all, the music starts playing Eloise, and all the people are starting to file in and take their seats. And so it's supposed to start, and there's supposed to be this little boy that comes down in the middle, and he's going to ring a bell to say the wedding is starting. And she had like 30 cousins, so they all had some kind of something that they were going to do. Well, this little boy came in that door back there, ringing the bell, and ran straight across the back of the church and out the other door. And his mother was chasing him, and he was going, <laughs> he was just ringing that bell. The next kid comes up, and he's got a sign that says, you know, the, the bride's name and the groom's name. And he's holding this sign, and it says, true love always kind of thing, like it etched it in a tree. And he's walking down here, and he's supposed to come to the side and come up the stairs. He throws the sign up on the stage and hoists his leg up on the stage and climbs up right here in front of me, right up, right up there. Takes the sign back up, and I'm laughing, and I'm going, golly, this is going to be hilarious. Everything else, everybody comes in, and the bride and the groom are standing there. We get set, and I'm like, man, we got where we needed to be. Everybody's lined up. I open my Bible, and I start to say something. And a lady sitting out in the middle, there's probably 500 people sitting there. A lady in the middle who's probably in her 20s, late 20s. She goes, hold on for a minute, hold on, wait. And I went, oh no, what is going on here? And she said, I want to get a picture. Everybody turn around. Everybody on stage turned around and this woman went, three, two, one, click. Let me get that one, hang on, say cheese. Click. And I went, this woman likes to be the center of attention pretty much everywhere she goes. And for us, we're going to learn today some of how to deal with some of that kind of stuff. When I lived in Atlanta and I worked at IBM, I was sitting at a lunch table with a guy, a really nice, handsome guy, had a really good job with um, IBM. And we were talking about dating and stuff, and he was married. And his wife worked for IBM, and she was gorgeous and sweet as could be. Any dealings you had with her, she was so sweet. And he was sitting there going, somebody said, Joe, you're lucky. You're married to Sue. And he's like, he looked, this is fake. He just went, and we were like, what are you talking about? You're gorgeous together. You don't have to live with her. And I went, okay. And, and so everybody there was kind of like, so what's wrong with her? And he said, do you know when she cleans the bathtub, she doesn't dry it out when she gets finished? And all these guys who are sitting around this table who just idolize this woman. You know, when she walked by, we all, you know, with that kind of, she was very, very nice woman. We were going, you're an idiot. Because that was all he could come up with about how awful she was. Those, it was those kind of stories. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is going to be uh, the way that we look at things and the way that we uh, deal with the stuff that goes on around us. We've got to learn some lessons. And there's some great Bible lessons that we're going to learn. Would you turn in Genesis? Let's, let's start in Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to go backwards a little bit from where we were. We've been talking about Joseph for two weeks. I'm sorry, this microphone is still on, and when I say anything, it, it pops. Genesis 25. And the reason that I'm going to start there is a question that many of us have to try to take hold of, and that is, 
Why is our current family so screwed up? Or my life so screwed up? And sometimes it is parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. It's a cycle that goes on. And it's, you know, God doesn't punish the kids for the sins of the Father. But sometimes the sins that we have in our life, they go out like ripples. And we can't stop that. We can't stop the repercussions from happening. Let me give you an example. My dad, my real dad, was an alcoholic drug addict. When he got thrown into jail, was that a problem just for him? No. It was a problem for his mom and dad, for my mom who was married to him, for me as his kid. And so those ripples go out, and he could say in the jail, hold me, and go, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have put myself here. And we go, we forgive you, but did the ripples stop? No. Those things still went out. And so here we have this story of uh, Jacob and Esau. Isaac and Rebekah are the parents, and they have these twins, Jacob and Esau. And you know this story because if you've gone to any of the Bible studies at this church or another church, if you've gone to vacation Bible schools or anything, listen to a sermon or two, you've heard of Jacob and Esau. And these two, these two sons, as soon as they came out of the womb, they were kind of going at each other. And the parents played favorites. The dad liked the older son Esau, the mom liked Jacob, and they kind of stuck around with each other for the most part. But one of the things that goes on is that Esau comes in from hunting, and his brother, Jacob, is cooking some stew. And he's, Esau's starving, and he says, give me some of that stew. And Jacob says, I'll sell you some for your birthright, because you're the oldest son. You were the first one, even though they're twins. You were the first one to come out. You have the birthright in our family. And Esau says, what's good is the birthright if I starve to death? Give me, give, me, give me the soup. So he gave him some soup. And then later on, Jacob uh, deceives his blind father. Now when you hear the story of Jacob and Esau, and you hear the story, the part of the story where Jacob deceives his father who's blind by putting goat and sheep stuff on his arms so he's pretending to be Esau, puts it on the back of his neck, makes himself smell like Esau. He goes in with some food that his dad likes, and he deceives him. I always thought of that story that Jacob was about 15, 16 years old. He's at least 40. He's at least 40 at this point. And he's a 40-year-old going into his dad who has a disability and takes advantage of him, and it's the mother who says, this is a good idea. He goes in, pretends to be Esau. Isaac eats the food, and... Jacob gets his father's blessing. Now that's deceit, that lie, that trickery, the stuff that went on, like buying, you know, selling your brother uh, some soup, those kind of things, they have repercussions in your life later on. So after Jacob uh, lied and stole Esau's blessing, what do you think, how do you think Esau felt about, felt about that? The Bible says he wanted to kill Jacob. He was very angry with him. And so the mom, Rebecca, says, Jacob, you need to go to my family in Haran, several hundred miles away, and uh, go there and stay, and I'll tell you when the coast is clear. I'll tell you when Esau has relented. And he goes there. Now, I want you to watch this because this is what goes on when we, when we have that sin in our lives, and then it creates the stuff that goes on. Jacob goes, he meets Laban, and he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And Laban says, what are your wages going to be here working for me? He says, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll let me marry your daughter, Rachel. Uh, I, don't know. I don't know if I'd marry you if I'd work seven years for her. I'm, 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 I'm just kidding. I, I probably would have. I probably would have worked seven years. But at, back then, modesty prevailed, and they put you in the veils and all that stuff. So you couldn't really tell, you know, uh, until you, you would have never seen her uh, intimate-wise until the wedding night. So he works seven years. He goes into this tent, I'm imagining, because they're nomads for the most part, I believe. And so Jacob goes in, and there's a woman there in veils, and it's very dark. can't imagine there's any candles or anything. And he wakes up the next morning, and his new bride is Leah, the older sister. And he's already made love to her and consummated the marriage. And he comes out and goes, hang on. You, what's the word? Deceived me. Okay, so everybody keep your finger there and let's look at a couple of passages here. I want you to turn with me to Galatians 6 in the New Testament. 
verses 7 through 10. So, everybody knows how to find whether it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, or Colossians, right? General Electric Power Company. They'll keep it in order for you if you're going to be trying to keep that straight. But Galatians chapter 6, and then it's 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man uh, reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, to please their flesh, uh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Did you hear that? We will reap what we sow. Now that's important in church life. Because especially for Jacob, you saw that in early in his life, and in fact, in the, in the Hebrew, his name is idiomatic. It actually makes the connotation, when you, when you see that name in Hebrew, it means deceiver. He that deceives. So his name even means that. And so what he put into practice as a kid, what turned out later on in life. That's what happened to him. And in fact, he works for 20-something years, 20 years for Laban. And all that time, Jacob says, Laban, you have changed my wages ten times. If, if, a, if an animal disappeared, you made me pay for it. You worked me in the heat. You worked me in the cold. Uh, you treated me poorly. And if it wasn't for God, you would leave me empty-handed and send me home with nothing. Because what Jacob is experiencing later in life is some of the payback he's reaping what he sowed through the years because he saw the section in line have the possibility of way of getting things done and so he's getting that back in full measure later on in his life now for us i want you i said keep your hand back there let's look at chapter 28 of genesis because i want you to see something because this is where we sit today as a church and as individuals in a country that is struggling with COVID and all of those things, look with me at um, verse, I guess, verse 19. No, it's verse 10, sorry. My vision is, I have trouble seeing the light here. Jacob left Beersheba, and this is 28, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you, did you notice, listen up, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. If I had that dream and God spoke those words to me, would you be going, oh man, or would you be going, yes, that sounds awesome. What an amazing dream. And yet, for Jacob, this is his response. When, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Listen to this. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me. What was that one? If, did you hear the if? If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tent. Please notice the if. 
Because God has made all of us so many promises, so many amazing things. He has said to us, hey, I have, you are free and you're free indeed. Those are Jesus' words to us. And yet many of us are in bondage and we feel like every day that we're in some kind of slavery to our job or our marriage or our kids or whatever it might be. And yet God has said, I promise you this. So how do we go from when we're sitting here trying to decide how do we choose better, getting better, versus getting bitter? Because you know that, that you remember when um, in Mark chapter 9, there's a man that comes to Jesus with his son who has a demon. And he says, my son gets thrown on the ground and um, he throws him into the fire, throws him into the water, and, and it's afflicted him forever. Uh, and the man says, if you can do something, Jesus will. And Jesus says, if I can. And the man says, forgive me for my unbelief. That's where we sit today. That's the difference between faith. The opposite is what? It's unbelief. It's not trusting in what God says and what he plans to do. So when he calls us and tells us things, he says, hey, uh, I want you to do this, and I promise you that if you do that, then this will happen. We need to trust him at his word. We need to take him at that. Do you know what the difference between the words better and bitter is? What's the difference between those two words? The letter I. You've heard that before, right? And the I is what keeps getting in our way. That's part of what I was talking about when I was talking about the lady that wanted to take a picture at the wedding. It's part of what I was talking about when I talked about the guy that worked at IBM. Is the I, that they kept getting in their own way. Because they were the center of their universe. Now you can walk in here on any Sunday and you can find a reason to complain. Is that not right? Shake your head this way. The lighting, you know, Ellie, the lighting, it's too, it's too dark in here. Or it's too bright in here. You know what else? Too hot in here. No, too cold in here, Eloise. Is it not? Too, too cold. I like this car. I don't like that car. That, that, that microphone is too loud. It's too soft. I can't hear. Can we? This seat's hard. No, I like this seat. We, we can find a million different things to complain about, and yet we are in a blessed congregation, in a blessed area, living in the most affluent country in the world, Larry. We are. So for us, we've got to figure out, okay, so what are some action steps um, that I can put in place in my life? The first one, of course, is prayer. A lot of any fear, as I say, that might uh, knock us down. Will you look with me in um, James chapter 4? James chapter 4, back of the Bible, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. Okay, so James chapter 4. And it's verse 3. That's the end of chapter 2. It's the end of verse 2. I, don't, I guess I'll read all, all of it there. I'll start at the beginning. What causes fights? This is James 4 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask the wrong motive that you may send what you get on your pleasures. Did you hear the part about we don't get because we don't ask? For us, many of us will come to church here, maybe have for decades, and how many of you all have prayed fervently that fruit will be produced here, that people will get saved and baptized here. I'm talking about daily. This, remember verse that's on these five, pray without ceasing. So for us, how, how much prayer are we putting into, hey, people getting saved and baptized, people growing in their faith, people joining the church, people becoming leaders in the church? How much prayer have you done about COVID? Well, we've done a lot of praying about COVID, I think, as a lot of people have, because they feel like that could kill me. It killed me, so I'm going to be serious about the praying. Remember last week, when did I say that most people pray? When do they call me and they say, I want to pray? Somebody's in the hospital die. That's when they call me, when death is at the door. So here we are, and, and God says, hey, I want you to pray. I want you to ask me. So we need to be, as the body of Christ, Matthew 18, where two or more gathered, there I am also. We're here, aren't we, Ellie? We're, we're here. Right, Larry? We're the body of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Columbia. And so we're supposed to come together and pray. 
Okay, the next one is we've got to stop playing the what if game. This is something that I have made up that it afflicts all of us. Anybody here play the pretend game in your head? You may do it, you don't know it. Let's say you and your, your mom are arguing, and your wife says, you should go over there and you should talk to her. And you go, if I go over there and I walk in the door, she's going to immediately say this, and then I'm going to say this, and then this is going to go on, and Dad's going to get in the middle of it. None of that's occurred, has it? It's occurred in our head. It's what we think is going to happen. And if our thoughts are mostly negative, then when somebody says, hey, you should go apply for a job here, what, does, what goes through your head? Why would I go apply for that job? I believe if I do, then they're just going to turn me down and I'm going to feel worse about myself than I was before I went in there. Some of us do this on a daily basis. Of uh, you know, I, I am notorious for watching TV and I'll turn on a ball game and my team will get behind by seven points and I go, I've had enough of this. And I turn it off and I walk away and you'll go, it's the first quarter. You're already done. And I said, it's over. We're never coming back from that. We're down. You know? That's part of that, how we see things. So we've got to get rid of that, that what if game. And uh, my mother-in-law yesterday said 50% of the stuff that we worry about never happens. 50%. She said she read an article that said that. I said, I don't know what she read, but I thought that was great as far as what it said. The, the next one that's there. I want us to, as part of our prayer life, do a prayer journal. And if you sitting there going, oh, now Chris is going to make me find something. i got to go find a prayer journal. Where am I going to get one? Well, uh, Jimmy Epstel and I, we've got these really nice prayer journals here. These, these fancy ones, these 70 page. Uh, how much did you pay for yours, Jimmy? I think I paid 20 cents for school supplies, you know, when I bought mine, you know. But that's what I use, and they're stacked in my office, and I can go back through any of them and look at the prayer requests and see the answers to those prayers. Because we have short term memory, we got too much going on, we don't remember five years ago. If I said, What did you do last Tuesday? you'd be going, Man, I would be doing that. I'd be going, I don't remember what I was doing last Tuesday. So for us, we've got to be able to journal that so that we can look back on that at a later day. The next thing that we need to do is um, we've got to get to the point of where we are using our faith. So many of us would go and say these words, I wish I was like so-and-so. Man, they really know the Lord. They really have a, a, you know, they're really on fire for the Lord. They really, God really blesses them. I wish I was like them. Well, for most of us, it's just a question of us stepping out in faith. Let me tell you this. Look me in the eye. If you pray and you say, Lord, speak to me, he's going to speak to you. Most of the time when he says to me, Lord, it's things like, go do this, and I'll go, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, that sounds hard. That sounds difficult. That sounds risky. But he's going to say, hey, I, want, I need you to go do this. And at that moment, we need to step out in faith, not playing that way of game in our head, but we need to step out and go do it. Sometimes it's as simple as walking over and talking to somebody. Simple as just going over and saying, hey, um, my name is Chris. And then maybe you have the opportunity to invite them to church or maybe just to listen in that moment and give them a word of encouragement from the Bible. It is in those moments that God grows our faith. Can you imagine standing on the boat and Peter asking the question of Jesus who was walking on the water, can I come to you? Because Peter was a commercial fisherman. He had experience on the water. He knows that whenever you step off the boat into the water, what happens? Plunk all the way to the bottom, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm a fat guy and I don't float real well. I'm sorry. When I get off that boat, boom, right in the water. And so Peter asks, and it says that when he stepped out of the boat, he walked on water until when? He looked away from Jesus, and he looked at the wind and the waves, and his faith went, and he started sinking, and Jesus kept him by the hand. For us, we need to use our faith and trust what God says in Scripture, which requires us to know what he says in Scripture. That's why our Bible studies and Sunday school classes are so important, is that we know God's Word, and we put it into action in our lives. The last thing is this, and I'm going to move away from this and I try to stand behind here because we record for um, Facebook Live and we record for uh, YouTube for those folks that are homebound or anybody that is out of state um, for them to be able to uh, watch as well online. 
But for us, I want us to be able to leave here today because Jimmy and I are of the mindset that when you go to church, when you leave, you want to be encouraged. You want to leave feeling, hey, I've got some things I can put into practice and good stuff is going to happen. Blessings are going to come and my life is going to change. Well, that's not always easy because it took me 40 years to get this out of shape. How long is it going to take me to get back in shape? It probably won't be. Doug, I wish you might give me a pill and say, here, you lose 20 pounds overnight, take this pill. I wish, I wish that was the case, but it's not. So for us, we're, the changes that we're looking for, God can say it overnight. He can do it that way. But most of the time, I see a process of sanctification that happens in our lives, and that day by day, He molds and shapes us into the people He wants us to be. So today, one of the first things that we can do when we walk out of here is know, without a doubt, what God has done for us. If I said, this is not there, so don't just open it. If I said, Bob, reach underneath your pew there, and there's an envelope. And inside that envelope is a four-day stay at a five-star hotel in Destin over Labor Day weekend. And he reached under there, and he went, oh, my goodness. And I said, everybody here has got one. And you all reached under there, and he went, oh, my goodness. We're at the Marriott on the far on the ocean in Destin. Oh, my goodness, Chris, you're the greatest guy ever. All you people here, y'all would be like, I mean, you would be running around. You'd be going to your car going, I'm going to go to Destin. I mean, I'm serious. You would be so excited and pumped up about that. And you know what? This is this. Jesus died on the cross so that we can go to a perfect place, heaven. And he didn't say, I'm going to let you go for one day. You get to go to this perfect place. Where the streets are paved. We go. You get to go for one day. He said, how long do you get to go? Forever. He created a perfect place. Let us go there forever. And all that is required of us, he says, is just to believe that he died on the cross for our sins and to ask him to take charge of our lives, come and live in our hearts. And then he does. And he comes and he flows through us. And what I mean by that, that's not, there's nothing crazy there. It's just on a day, daily basis, he uses us in the world if we let him. So I want you to leave here with that encouragement of knowing, hey, if I've accepted Jesus into my life, I have heaven awaiting me. I have blessings here on the earth because God says I came to give you life, eternal life, after I die, which is great, right, Patsy? But if you're, if you're relatively young and healthy, when you die, might be, you think it might be 40 years from now. But he says I came to give you life and life to the full. And there's two things going on there. I gave you eternal life, but I'm going to give you life to the full here on earth. And that's the thing we are so desperate for at times, and it is us turning it over to Jesus. So as Jill comes, Jill and Sila come up to lead us in our closing uh, hymn of invitation. Uh, I think the, the book is still up there. I think you need to move stuff. I'm going to be right here if you would like to pray.